find out what pleases the Lord? Moses answers the question by commanding us, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. It pleases the Lord when we love Him with everything that we are and that we have, when He and He alone is the ultimate love beyond our families, our possessions, even our own lives. And so Moses then presents and sets before us a life plan, very specific, very practical behaviors meant to train and maintain a life in which we love God above all others. And so he says to us, What I set before you today, have it on your heart. What he would have us do on a daily, regular basis is to have in our minds the love of God and the desire to love Him as our talk and our self-talk within our minds. But not just to keep it within ourselves. Impress them upon your children. When you yourself are the teacher, you learn. When you are the teacher, you have to know the topic. Our families learn best when we live what we're saying, when our actions match our words. Moses goes on to say, tie them as symbols and, and talk about them when you sit in your house. When you walk along the road, when you get up in the morning, when you lie down, discuss and have this be your regular conversation in the family. And then tie them as symbols. Wear them on your body. Symbols have this amazing power to bring out within us an emotional response as well as the meaning of everything that the symbol represents. Write them on your possessions. Hang them from your body. It is this constant, ongoing training to keep before yourself, before your family, your children, and your community that it pleases the Lord to love Him with everything that you have. Now for us, we just don't quite get why you need to have all of this constant effort to remember, to bring before the mind that I'm supposed to love God. In fact, if it was simply to remember that information, we could remember that pretty simply. But it isn't just to have that available, but to actually live it. Well, in our culture, we really don't understand how the mind and the body and the soul, the heart, everything is needed in the training. We would just assume that everything happens right up here and everything else follows. That's what we call a brain-centered life. And we went to school with a brain-centered mentality from our teachers. What are you tested and graded on? that you know the information, that you can spell it back out on a piece of paper, that you can recite it. We then just assume our bodies will tag along with us, but they're really secondary to the training. And there's very few of us today that have any kind of working knowledge of what the heart or the soul is. It's so vague in our culture that it really is irrelevant to training. And so we then live very practically as if we were a mind using a body to then do what our brains think is best. And so in this context, if it is to love God above all things, then we learn that information and then we get on with life. And we do so to our peril. And obviously you have a body 
you have so much more. And it will not be left behind in the training. In fact, your body uh, doesn't really care what your brain has learned at all. If it's extremely tired, hungry, sick, your body has great desires from what it sees and touches and tastes and feels and all of the senses. And then your heart, it has these strong emotions that takes all of the data from your body of what it sees and feels and touches and smells and then it gives a running commentary about what everything that you're encountering means. And that information that it's giving you may very well contradict everything you've just learned in your brain. You know what I mean. It, you really don't care that the mind knows to love God with everything if it doesn't feel right. I can't do that because my heart is so heavy. It's so weighed down. I'm so mad at God right now. Or I'm just so distracted with these other exciting things. Who even thinks of it? And yet, you and I have no other life plan available to us other than we'll put things in your brain, put the right things in your brain, and then the right emotions and the right behaviors will follow in the body. But my question for you is, how is that working so far? Are you actually able to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to do everything that He has commanded? Especially when your body is all out of sorts and your heart is weighed down. Who even thinks of the right thing in such a moment? And so if we are going to find out what pleases the Lord, we're going to need a life plan that's going to include everything. And that's the reason I would have you consider uh, the sinful woman who crashed the Jesus party. And see how everything was working and involved in her life as she loved God with everything that she had. Look first then at her body and that where she is. She had to be in the presence of Jesus. She crashed this party. She was not an invited guest. And there she would remain. And she would not be thrown out. She will be there. Why? Why did this woman have to be in the presence of Jesus? And the answer is found when you look at her eyes. And you see the tears in her eyes. These tears are not the tears of remorse. When we feel ashamed about our sins, we run away from God, not toward Him. You know, you think about Peter when he denied Jesus and then he realizes what he did. He, he ran away and he whipped, wept bitterly. This woman, in her tears, has run to Jesus. Why? It is the heart that has been completely changed it is the heart that has been completely filled. Think about what your heart longs for. Don't you long to be accepted? To be wanted? To be forgiven everything and to be made pure and clean? To have everything erased that you've done wrong in your life and, and to be before the one who loves you? When you find that love in your life, you, you have to be with that person, right? Even on a human level. These tears are the tears that naturally flow from a heart that is so filled with the love received. And so she has to be with Jesus personally. But it wasn't just in His presence. It's never enough for a heart that is so changed with, filled with love. She has to serve Him. And so look at her hands. And look, she's kissing his feet. Think about the day and the age that Jesus walked the streets. They walked the same place their animals walked. His feet are not just dusty, dusty. They're yucky, yucky. 
And it was the normal custom that the host of that party would provide water to clean your feet because they needed cleaned. But this, for some reason, had been omitted by this guest. But this woman, seeing what needed to be done, she cleans them with her own tears, her own hands, and she kisses the feet of Jesus, though they have the filth of the streets on them. Because she was once called filth of the streets, but now no more by this man. Now no more. Her value has been completely restored. It is a service that she is happy to provide. And now, look at her hair. It's a makeshift towel for her. Everything about this woman's body is now being appropriately used in service to this man, Jesus. And now she is the envy of any woman, any man of that day or today, who could be so near Jesus who could be so useful and helpful and caring to him. But I save the best to last. Smell the room, the perfume that she used. Smells are a powerful symbol. Smells bring back into our hearts and our minds vivid memories. Think of the smell of baking bread or cookies and you think of mom or grandma smells have that power to bring us back to a moment from now on in this woman's life this smell will be associated to this act of service and to this one to whom she serves but that smell also tore at the hearts and the consciences of her former male clients who were perhaps in that room and at that party who would remember that smell of being with her in secret but now in shame of their heart but for this woman, that smell would be the smell of redemption, the smell of forgiveness, the smell of new life, the smell of a life redeemed by Jesus. See what love did in the entire body, soul, mind, and strength in this woman? It changed everything. She didn't just learn in a classroom, oh yes, Jesus loves me. And then she tried to convince her heart, even though her heart knows what a horrible woman and horrible things that she's done, but she tried to convince the heart, and then, well, I, maybe I, oh no, I, they'll never accept me. No. Love came and was born in this woman, in her body, in her heart, in her soul, all at the same time, first from being loved, and now she uses everything to love. A life plan, a life change that has come to her. And it all came from first being loved. And so the question for all of us right now is that do you believe with all of your heart, with all of your strength, soul, with all of your strength, do you believe that God loves you? It is not something that the brain can force on the heart because the heart won't have it that way. But being in the presence of Jesus even right now. Having Him speak to the entire person, heart, mind, body, and soul. Perhaps you have yet to hear for the first time. Perhaps you've heard for the hundredth time and yet hear again tonight, perhaps in a new and a deeper way. Hear Jesus Himself say to you, your many sins are forgiven. I love you. You are a child of God. Ah, uh, but is it true? The brain asks that question. 
the heart feels the doubt. The answer to your entire being is to behold with your eyes, to behold with your ears, to behold Jesus hanging on the cross, purchasing your redemption. Behold Jesus in His resurrection on Easter. Smell now the Easter lilies. And know that the resurrected Jesus is with you now. A dear friend of Jesus wrote, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The mind, the eyes, the ears, the smell, the soul, the heart, the emotions. God comes with a life plan to train and to teach everything so that we might love Him. You see, the command of Moses to love God is not a burden for the child of God any more than it is a burden for a young boy or girl to love their admired parent. And while it is not a burden, that doesn't mean that it's easy or that it's automatic. It does take a life plan that involves all of our senses, our heart, our emotions, our body, and that's what the sermon take-home is for today. I invite you to, to take this home. And as you lived with last week, Psalm 23, and you meditate, meditated on how the Lord is your shepherd, so this week the, the spiritual discipline is to memorize. That you would then memorize and then live with and bring it to mind every morning. This phrase or sentence... I am one in whom Christ dwells and in whom He delights. I live in a strong, unshakable kingdom.